Okay, so the last lesson uh, that we were talking about uh, dealt with the worldwide effects of the flood and the uh, new environment that Noah and his family found themselves in. Talked about that last week, a little bit of review. Uh, the physical world had changed dramatically, right? Extreme temperatures creating change in climate. You know, we think you know, climate change like, oh, something new. You know, well, no, the climate started to change after the flood. There was a severe climate change and we're still experiencing the change in climate that began there. Uh, the earth's surface now mostly covered with water and mountains. After the flood, of course, the natural protective layer that, that vapor, that water vapor layer that was around the earth has been dissolved. And so um, this subjects the earth to uh, genetic changes, deviations, mutations, diseases, so on and so forth. Another change, of course, the social world now has changed as well. One family to repopulate. God now authorizes human government at this point up until this point, it's a patriarchal society, but now government is established to mitigate the evil in the world. Diets will include meat, which will develop various types of work and trade for the first time. I'm not saying that men didn't eat meat before this, but God authorizes it only here. And then another change, the spiritual world has changed as well. Before, God walked with man and the creation was a constant and unbroken reminder of God's love and God's you know, pleasure with, with man. Now the environment is hostile and a constant threat and a reminder of man's fallen state and ultimate death. And yet despite all of this, as we read in chapter nine, verse seven, it says, as for you, now God is speaking, as for you, be fruitful and multiply populate the earth abundantly and multiply in it. So despite all of these changes, despite all of this uh, you know, disruption, God for the second time gives the command to multiply and repopulate the earth. So in order to provide reassurance that despite the reality of man's sinful condition, uh, and, and, and the fallen world, God still loves and plans to save man. God provides some reassurance here. I mean, don't you do that sometimes, those, those of you who have kids? They've disobeyed you, you know, the, you've counted one, two, three, you're up to 19, 20, 21, you know what I'm saying? And they really do something you know, that requires some sort of punishment, maybe you know, a little slap or in the corner, you know, whatever it is, you know, and they cry and, oh, you don't love me anymore, and so on and so forth. And after the punishment is over, haven't we as parents seen ourselves take the ki our kids and bring them closer to us and say, well, you know, mommy loves you, daddy loves you, you know, but you've got to listen. You know, and we, we reassure them that it's okay. You know, that, that break between them and us the fact that we may have spoken to them sternly, there may have been punishment, there may have been some pain even, we reassure them that it's okay, that all that is over now, let's, 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 kinda, let's obey in the future. Well, that's what's happening here. The floods wiped everything out. God has said, okay, go back out, repopulate the earth. But Noah needs reassurance. And so God gives reassurance in two forms. One, He gives His word that this new environment, despite its hostility, will be able to sustain man and will continue to do so until the end of time. I go back here, Genesis 8.22, where God says, while the earth remains seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night, the last one I like, shall not cease. This business of the earth is falling apart, everything's going to be destroyed, you know, and they make movies about it. And no. Why? Because God said, you know, yeah, there'll be disruptions, climate change, quote, we see it, but He promises seed time and harvest, summer and winter, night and day, 
It's a promise. You can go ahead now. You can go ahead with your life. The, the catastrophe that God brought on the earth with the flood, don't worry about that. He also provides a physical token as a visible reminder that He will not allow the environment to overwhelm them once again. And this is the subject of the lesson we're going to talk about tonight, and that's the Rainbow Covenant. Rainbow Covenant, chapter nine. Let's read verses eight, nine, and 10. It says, Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, Now behold, I myself do establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that comes out of the ark, even every beast of the earth. So note the subjects of God's covenant. Remember we talked about covenant last time? A covenant is a promise of God where He sets the conditions and He guarantees the results. We can abide by the conditions and receive the rewards or not receive the rewards, it doesn't matter. If He makes the covenant, everything He says that's going to happen in the covenant is going to happen. So He mentions Noah and all of his descendants, which includes everyone since, I mean, we're all, you know, that includes us. You know, we're descendants of Noah. But he's also careful to include all of the animals with Noah as well. So animals, you know, we know they don't have a soul. They have sentient life, but they don't have a soul in the image of God. But they are still God's creatures and He includes them in His care as well. So He's making a promise to man and to the creation that He will care for them. So let's read the long passage, verse 11 to 17. He says, I establish my covenant with you, and all flesh shall never again be cut off by the water of the flood, neither shall there again be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I am making between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all successive generations. I set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. It shall come about when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow will be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and never again shall the water become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the cloud, then I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. And so the promise is that the earth and life upon it will never again be destroyed by a great flood. Will there be destruction by floods? Yes. Will there ever be a flood that will destroy everything again like the great flood? No, no. I mean, could you imagine after Noah, every time it started to rain? <laughs> you know, without this promise, people thinking, uh-oh, here we go again. I mean, if you didn't have this promise, nobody would live you know, further than a mile away from the ark. <laughs> so this promise here gives man you know, the, 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 the courage to, to go on. Even though the environment will be harsh, there may be hurricanes and floods and whatever that would seem like a repeat of the worldwide destruction, the rainbow, he says, will appear as a reminder of the promise. Now some people say the rainbow was always there and God simply invested it with meaning. But think about what we learned in the pre-flood environment. In the pre-flood environment, there was no rain. Everything was watered by the underground tributaries and the water vapor, and you know, it was like a hothouse, it was like a greenhouse. And so there was no rain, no rain, no, no storms, no rainbows. So this is a first instance and the original significance that God gives to it. Now, of course, we can explain a rainbow physically, we can explain it, the idea here is it will now appear for the first time and God gives it its first meaning. Such a shame that the rainbow, something that is biblical, that, that the only place that actually gives it significance, a spiritual or a theological significance from the Bible has been co-opted now and is now the symbol for 
uh, gay rights or, or gay life and so on and so forth. You know, a terrible, a terrible thing. So um, we, we continue here. Um, although the world does not acknowledge it, whenever we do see a rainbow, it still remains a direct sign of God's promise to maintain the environment and to sustain life until Jesus comes. Basically, that's what the rainbow does. People get killed in floods and so on and so forth, but we know that God is not going to destroy the world with water. And when you think about it for a minute, I mean, there's more water than anything else in the world. So you know, it would seem that the water has the potential to destroy the earth still, but we have this promise. Okay, so in the world there are various ways of classifying races. So let's talk about the sons of Noah. Uh, different ways to classify uh, various cultures and races. The three or three, four, five, six, if you, depends on the system that you use. There are Caucasian, white, Negroid, which is black, Oriental, now we say Asian, and then there are mixtures of these. There are about 150 nations of significance in the world, about 3,000 main languages, a lot of offshoots and dialects, but about 3,000 main languages. And the source of all this has been a problem for evolutionary scientists. Yeah, if, you've, if you're wondering, has he just changed gears? Yeah, I've changed gears. You know, we're, we're moving away from the flood and the effects of the flood, we're moving on now to Noah, his sons, and the repopulation of the earth and where the races come from, okay? So as I say, um, the source of all of these has been a problem for evolutionary scientists. Uh, there are some reports today that indicate that man originated in, north, in the North African region or in the Middle Eastern region. You know, for us, that's not, like, that's not a stretch, right? But if you're an evolutionary scientist, you know, uh, whoa, that's, you know, that, that gives you a problem that all races all come from one place. Doesn't match your idea of how things work. A lot of people don't like the implication of these findings because they seem to confirm the biblical record of the origin of different races. The Bible does say all the races started in one place and moved out. The Bible does provide the information on the beginning and the dispersion of the early groups that ultimately developed into different races that we now have today, and we're going to try to make those bridges during this lesson here. Let's read verse 18 and 19. It says, Now the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. Okay, so how was the earth populated? The Bible says in black and white, the whole earth was populated from these three. You are free to disbelieve that. You can reject that. You can say, that, you know, yeah, I, I don't buy that. Okay, it's your choice. What you cannot do is say the Bible doesn't say that. You can't do that. You don't have to agree, but you can't say the Bible doesn't say that because it says it right here. From these, the whole earth was populated. So we're going to continue to stick just to what the scriptures say, and let's see how, how, does, that, how does that work, okay? So in this passage, the sons of Noah are once again introduced and they are brought forward as the originators of what is now the human race. I want to read a passage from uh, uh, Dr. Henry Morse's uh, book, The Genesis Flood, he says, all the physical characteristics of the different tribes and nations must, therefore, have been present in the genetic constitutions of these six people, the three sons and their wives. Somehow, by the regular, regular mechanisms of genetics, variation, recombination, all the various tribes and nations must have Develop. So let's keep reading uh, what the Bible says. It says, Then Noah began farming and planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and uncovered himself inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. 
But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father and their faces were turned away so that they did not see their father's nakedness. So an interesting story here. Uh, we're we're kind of given a look at the character of these three men through an incident that happened during a moment of weakness in Noah's, in Noah's life. So the Bible says that Noah planted a vineyard, he drank the wine and he got drunk. So nothing new about that, right? First time, however, in the Bible that wine is mentioned and it is mentioned in a, in a negative way as something that can be abused. It says, uh, it doesn't say, but we know that Noah was a great man. <clears throat> Excuse me, look at what he's gone through, this man. <clears throat> the destruction of the earth and you know, er everything, yet he's remained faithful, a great man, but not a perfect man. You can be a man of faith, you can be a great spiritual man, doesn't mean you're a perfect man. Uh, he was strong against worldly temptation, but in a weak moment he fell. And in doing so, he shamed himself because of it. So he, get the picture, he's laying drunk in his tent and naked in a drunken stupor, probably just hot, <laughs> you know, just hot. Now here we see the reactions and some of the character of his sons. Ham, and you know, they keep mentioning Ham, who is the forefather of, of the Canaanites. They don't mention about Japheth, they don't mention about Shem, they keep mentioning about Ham, and there's, there's a reason for that, okay? Keep that in mind. So what does Ham do? He enters the tent and it says he gazed at his father. Now some people say that you know, this was a, there was a sexual connotation here, but the fact that the next verse says that he told his brothers about it suggests really another situation. The term gaze in the Hebrew means to look at with satisfaction. And then the term to tell refers to a telling with delight. Can you put the two ideas together here? You know, this reveals a man who is happy to see his father's weakness and reveal it to his two brothers. I, can't, you just, can't you just hear it? How many thousands of years ago was this? Can't you just hear it? Hey, you guys, you got to come and see this. The old man is out like a light, just buck naked. Come on, come on, this is hilarious. Isn't that human nature? Of course it is. So some believe that Ham, although a believer, was a rebellious individual and he was constrained under his father's rule and in seeing him in his weakness, he rejoiced and he tried to sway his brothers into mockery and rebellion. Yeah, not such a big shot now, eh, Mr. Noah, Mr. Patriarch, you know? This trait seemed to crop out in his ancestors. That's why they keep mentioning the Canaanites. If you study about the Canaanites, one of the things you're going to find out about that people, the Canaanites, is that they were extremely sexually perverse. Much of their religious practice had to do with uh, human sexuality, uh, you know, orgies, that type of thing. Shem and Japheth, the two brothers, they don't go along with his delight, but rather they tried to cover their father's shame and not see him in order to share that shame. They don't want their father to be shamed. Now the essential difference between them is that Ham obeyed out of constraint and fear and when the figure of authority fell, his respect and his self-control fell with it. The other brothers obeyed from faith and principle and so the one who embodied these principles when the father fell, their faith and their commitment did not fall with him. They continued to uphold principles. Isn't that what we want from our children? You know, we want them to make, the, how, many, how many times have we said this to our, those of you old enough that have had teenagers? How many times we have said to the teenagers, I'm raising you in such a way that when I'm not there, you're going to make the right decision. 
You're not going to make the decision because I'm watching you. You're going to make the right decision because that's what you want to decide, whether I'm there or not. Well, this is exactly, these two sons, they made the right, they made the right decision. Now there's an amazing similarity between Noah and Adam in their respective experiences. Adam, he was commanded to fill the earth and control it. Noah was commanded to replenish the earth after the flood. Adam, the ancestor of all men before the flood. Noah, ancestor of all men after the flood. Adam sinned by partaking of a forbidden fruit. Noah sinned by partaking of a fruit in a forbidden way. Adam, um, uh, uh, the result of his sin was that his nakedness was revealed. Uh, for Noah, the result of his sin was that his nakedness was revealed. Number five. Um, Adam was covered uh, by God with animal skins and um, Noah was covered by his sons with his own cloak. Number six, just there's seven of these. Uh, the result for Adam ended in a prophecy which affected future generations. You know, God gave him the promise of the seed. You know, the seed of Satan and the seed of the, the woman, those seeds, you know, that was the, the prophecy. For um, Noah, the result was a prophecy which affected each son and their future generations, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. And then finally, uh, along with the curse, there was also a promise of blessing in the future for Adam. And in the same way, along with the curse was also a renewed promise of a blessing. So let's keep going through this story, shall we? Verse 24, it says, when Noah awoke from his wine, he knew that his youngest son uh, had done to him. Rather, what his youngest son had done to him. So he said, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants he shall be to his brothers. He also said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. And so these verses contain the prophecy concerning the track that the descendants of these three men will take. So Noah wakes up from his drunken stupor, and in some way, probably his wife or his sons told him, he finds out what has taken place, now that the hearts and the true character of his sons are revealed to him, Noah makes a prophecy concerning each one of his sons. So he talks to Ham first. He refers to Ham through his descendants, Canaan. The writer is making sure that the connection between Ham and the Canaanites is made. You know, today, how would we say that? The apple, doesn't far fall, uh, the apple does not fall far from the, the tree. Well here he's saying, you know, you know Ham, his descendants are Canaanites. You know? The reader is like, oh okay, now we get it. You know, we know what kind of guy this is. But the specific curse is that the descendants of Ham will be in a position of service to the descendants of the other two brothers. This does not describe or support the idea of slavery or conquest, however. History shows that the Sumeritans, for example, uh, the Sumerians, for example, the Egyptians, the Ethiopians, some of the Oriental peoples who were descendants of Ham were never historically enslaved to anyone. However, history shows that their concerns Historically, as a people, the, the, the uh, Ham's descendants, uh, have been in the area of serving the, the cursed earth, if you wish, in their pursuit of development. Whereas the Shemites have had a more theological bent and the Japhites have had a knack for philosophy and commerce. And so the curse, the prophecy about Ham is that he'd be a servant of the earth, he would, he would toil in the earth, he would develop things to make the earth work and be in service to the others. 
Now several, I want to make an aside here, you know, parenthetical statement. Several centuries ago, many trying to justify the slavery of Africans and others, but mainly here in the United States, interpreted this verse to say that God had cursed the black man to slavery and a white man was justified in owning slaves because this was their position. And they would say, because the Bible says so. A lot of people say, how did people who call themselves Christians and go to church on Sunday and Wednesday or whatever, how did they then go back to their plantations and, and have slaves? How, could they, how did these two things work? Well, these two things worked because of this particular passage of scripture that was interpreted by preachers and teachers and so on and so forth to justify and to permit the keeping of black people as slaves. Well, first of all, as I say, not all descendants of Ham were black. That's to begin with. Secondly, it was service that the Hamites provided, not slavery, not slavery. Slavery is immoral, okay? It's immoral, slavery is immoral. So God would not, you understand what I'm saying? He would not institutionalize something that is immoral. So it's highly unlikely that Noah, under the, the, the power of the Spirit of God, would curse an entire race of people to perpetual slavery. But if your main income is derived and supported by keeping slaves, you might have a hard time you know, grasping this idea. You might prefer going with the other interpretation because it would be more self-serving. Historically, the Hamitic peoples have provided the world with basic concepts and inventions, tools that serve the purposes of the other races, but they themselves have never taken full advantage of their own innovations, okay? I mean, the Hamitic people, they were the original explorers and settlers of almost all parts of the world after the Tower of Babel. They were the first to cultivate vegetables and livestock in an organized way, first to develop basic structural forms and tools, first to develop weaving and fabric devices. Uh, they discovered the use of medicines and surgery. They invented basic math and navigation, surveying, I'm going on and on here, banking, postal systems, commerce, trade. They were the first to develop these types of activities in the world. Uh, not just Ham and his son, I mean the people that come out of that, uh, that source. Uh, paper, ink, printing, communication, first developed by various uh, ancestors of, of Ham. They provided much of the essential building blocks for social development, but they did not gain advantage or prosperity because of their overall contribution. That's, that's what Noah's prophecy is about. You're, you're, you're going to be in service to the others. The others are going to make bank with what you develop and what you produce. So in this way, they were the servant of servants. They served the interests of the other two. The Hamites served the material interests of the other two brothers and their descendants. But the Bible does not, I mean, not just this verse, but if you take the entire Bible, you can't support the idea of human slavery. I mean, you can't. All right, what about Shem? Only got five minutes, got to move quickly here. Very little is said about Shem, right? But the little bit that we have speaks volumes. The Shemites, who became the Semites, or the Semitic people, and from Shem's descendants came Abraham from whom came the Jewish people, and through whom came the Lord Jesus Christ, Shem. So there's a glimmer of this promise here because only for Shem does Noah mention a relationship and a knowledge of God. Doesn't mention God for Ham, 
Doesn't mention God for Japheth, but he does mention God for Shem. So we know of Shem that he was spiritual in nature. As a matter of fact, the term Jehovah is used here for Lord, implying that Shem knew the true God intimately and not just through his father. Also mentioned is the fact that Ham would serve his interests in the future. All right, Japheth, the last one. Noah says three things about Japheth. He would be enlarged. This term does not mean geographically, but rather philosophically, meaning open-minded, curious, wide interests. Uh, he also said they would, he would dwell in tents. That term means to have fellowship with. These two would share their lives and talents and advantages with one another. Also, Ham would serve the interests of Japheth, as I've explained. So these three men, they don't represent individual races, you know, like black, white, oriental, or Asian. They represent streams of nation that have a variety of races mixed with each one. They do represent, in, gener in a general way, however, how each stream has developed. Let me show you that. The Semites you know, from Shem, they have dominated religious motivations centered in monotheism. From the Shemites, we have uh, the main uh, monotheistic religions. The Jews and the Muslims come from the Shemites. Uh, the Zoroastrians, uh, an ancient religion, Zoroastrianism. But Zoroastrianism was a monotheistic religion. So from Shem, you know, we get the great monotheistic religions, just as Noah had said. That tribe would, would, would be sensitive to spiritual things. The, um, the Japhites, uh, their descendants include the Greeks and the Romans, Europeans, Americans. If you're wondering, I'm an American, where do I come from? Well, if you come from Europe or something like that, you know, you, you, this, is, this is where you go back, where we go back. The Japhites have excelled and stressed science and philosophy in their, in their development. And then the Hamites, Egyptians, Phoenicians, Asians, Africans, they have pioneered settlement and cultivation and technology. Now there are exceptions, of course, there's crossovers, but the general trend historically has followed the model originally set out by Noah in his prophecy. Last verse, it says, Noah lived 350 years after the flood. So all the days of Noah were 950 years and he died. So what this is telling us, the writer who's writing this, that Noah was the last patriarch to be unaffected by the new environment, living longer than anyone other than Jared uh, and Methuselah. The idea here is that now we're going to begin seeing people and when they start giving their ages, they're not going to be any more 900, 800, 700 now. The ages are going to be 300, 200, 100. We see now the effect of the harsh environment that people live in and the change of diet, uh, the introduction of disease in the environment and so on and so forth is going to take a toll on human life and it's going to, uh, going to shrink down. Okay, so the end of the life of the man who lived in both worlds before and after the flood. Next week we're going to go to the uh, Tower of Babel and see how the nations uh, developed from that particular incident.